Okay, let's get started. So, before the break, we considered one setting where we had n independent draws of Bernoulli random variables. Okay, and mu is unknown and we want to estimate it and we had this estimator and what we showed was that expected value of Vn equals mu and the variance of Vn is less than 1 over n and from this we showed that probability Vn does not belong to mu minus epsilon to mu plus epsilon is less than 1 by n epsilon square and we used to draw the confidence intervals from this we showed that if I sketch Vn as a function of me of n and I set my confidence level to be 99 percent then what I get are confidence intervals that look like this this is mu plus 10 by root 10 and this is mu minus 10 by root n. So now it turns out that for this particular setting that we have, Chebyshev's inequality is actually rather weak. This is too conservative a bound. We can do better because we have a sum of n iid random variables. And the correct bound to use is what is called the Hofding's inequality. And it says that the probability that Vn minus mu is greater than epsilon. So this is the same event as this one. Vn not in mu minus epsilon to mu plus epsilon actually decreases exponentially in n. So this is an exponential decrease. So this quantity here in Chebyshev's inequality this pro probability decreases as 1 over n epsilon square and that is sort of too slow a decay for practical purposes. You can for free tighten the bound and that stronger inequality is known as Hofding's inequality and Hofding's inequality says that this probability actually decreases as 2e to the minus 2n epsilon square. So here you see n is in the exponent, not as 1 over n. So this will be a much faster decrease and this will give us much sharper bounds. So we will actually be using Hofding's inequality for our analysis. Now this, now the advantage of Chebyshev's inequality is that it is more general. Uh, it applies to many random variables. Hofding's only applies when you have the random variable to be of this form. It should be an average of iid random variables. So here you require that the random variables you are summing up should be independent and identically distributed. In this case they are all iid Bernoulli mu so this inequality applies. Okay. You may not have seen this in a previous probability course because it is a bit more difficult to derive. And we won't derive it in this course either because the derivation is just based on some standard arguments in statistics and we don't want to spend time deriving it. You can read, I think the textbook in the appendix has a derivation but any standard textbook in statistics will have this inequality. So we will just use it as it is given to us and apply it in our problem. But you should all write this down because it's an important inequality. Any questions about Hofding's inequality?
Yeah, so Z1, Z2 to Zn has to be IID for this inequality to apply. Otherwise, it won't be applicable. So it, it applies only in very restricted settings. Chebyshev's inequality, although it is conservative, it applies for a very large class of random variables. Right? For any random variable where the density or distribution is defined, it applies. Uh, this one only applies in a setting like this, which fortunately is the case for us. So the advantage of this is that we can tighten the confidence interval for free. Instead of this, we will get new confidence interval that might look like this. They will be much smaller. For the same delta, our confidence intervals will be much closer to the true value of mu than what Chebyshev's inequality gives us. So let me try to demonstrate that. So let's say we go back to delta equals 0 0.01, okay? Now what Hofding says is that probability that Vn does not belong to mu minus epsilon to mu plus epsilon is, which is delta, is upper bounded by 2 e to the minus 2n epsilon square. So if we want 99% confidence, we set delta to be 0.01 and we can now compute epsilon in terms of delta. So we have 2 e to the minus 2 and epsilon square. If we set this to equal delta, then epsilon is square root of 1 by 2n log 2 by delta. Right? Just invert it. If we put delta to be 0 0.01, this will be 1 by 2n log 2 by 0 0.01. And you can simplify this. If you work out the math, this is like 1.63 by square root of n. So the point is that now you are confident. Previously, you had like 10 over root n, if you recall, for Chebyshev's inequality. For the exact same problem, Hofding gives you a much tighter confidence interval. So this is a more, uh, this says that Vn in fact is going to be much more accurate, represents like an uh, accurate estimate of mu than what Chebyshev's inequality predicts. So this is saying that if we have Vn versus n, this is the mu, then previously Chebyshev was something like this, right? Uh, Hofding will give you confidence bounds that might look like this. So this is coming from Hofding. And this is Chebyshev's. <coughs> so the problem has not changed. We have not modified the experiment and so on. But just by exploiting how the estimator is computed, Hofding says that actually Vn is a much better estimate of mu because the confidence level is much smaller compared to what uh, Chebyshev was going to predict. Okay. All right, so now we understand Hofding all Hofding's inequality, we understand the confidence levels, confidence intervals, and how to compute them. Okay? So we will now take this understanding and go back to path learning. So now we will revisit the framework we introduced earlier on in this lecture. So the question is, how is this example? We spent like a considerable amount of time on this example of having the jar drawing balls from it, two colors, and estimating the fraction of red balls. How is this particular example related to pack learning, where we had to find a relationship between the training error and test error? So recall, 
that in fact learning you had two types of errors. One was E n. If h is a hypothesis, we computed the training error, which was E n of h, which was 1 over n summation of the indicator function that y i is not equal to h of x i. And E out of h, which was the probability that y is not equal to h x. And we wanted to find how the in sample and out of sample errors were uh, related to each other. So given this example that we just saw, can anyone see a link between these quantities? Can anyone see how we can use the example on the previous few pages where we had this IID Bernoulli random variables which were draws from the jar and we are trying to estimate mu which was probability that any zi is 1, 2, and computing, estimating vn as this quantity to how e in and e out are related. Yeah? This is against zd because our probability of vn not equals to, not equals to the region of m like mu minus epsilon and where we know that mu is e e and then we know that the probability of not, e not being equal to the h of x would need to be lie within, within the region. Uh, I'm looking for something simpler. <laughs> so this is not directly related to the deviation. That's what you're saying. Yeah? So we just what if we just relate uh, mu to uh, L? Exactly, right? So mu is something that was unknown in our example. E out is unknown, right? So this is going to be our zi snub. This event here, this is binary value. It's either 0 or 1, right? So this will be our zi. This quantity here is just mu. It's the probability that uh, any of the zi's is 1, y is not equal to hx. So we'll let zi to be the event that is 1 if yi is not equal to h of xi and it is 0 if yi equals h of xi. And mu be the probability that y is not equal to hx. So E in now is 1 over n summation of zi i going from 1 to n. And we call this Vn. Right? We call this quantity Vn. It was the average. And the idea is we are trying to estimate V using estimate mu through Vn. In the example, we said that mu was not known to us we had z1 to zn in this case it's just the uh, error on the training set and we are trying to use vn to estimate mu so the probability that e in of h minus e out of h is greater than epsilon will be the probability that Vn minus mu is greater than epsilon. Now the question is can I use Hofding and claim that this is less than 2 e to the minus 2 n epsilon square? Is this valid? Can I apply Hofding to this particular setting or is there a problem? In the previous example, we used this and then we said that, well, uh, Vn minus mu greater than epsilon is less than 2 e to the minus 2 n epsilon square. Here I made a connection. I said that E n of h is 1 over n times summation of Zi. So this looks like Vn we defined previously. 
and again we are trying to estimate e out using e in and e out is the probability that y is not equal to hx so that is like our mu for this event right so then we are saying that probability that e in minus e out is greater than epsilon is same as the probability that v n minus mu is greater than epsilon and that is less than 2 e to the minus 2 n epsilon square. But is, can I use this last step? Can I make this or do I need to make some assumptions? You need IID, exactly. So for this to be true, you need that Z1, Z2 up to Zn are IID random variables. Is that going to be true or is there a problem here? So the question is, is it true that Z1, Z2 up to Zn which are defined like this are IID random variables? Yes, no? Why don't we just use championship bound? No, let's let's <laughs> stick to this because it's going to be hard to compute if they are not IID. Okay. Even Chebish, the, even when we computed Chebyshev's bound, the one over n thing mm -hmm. was coming from IID distribution. <laughs> so the question is is are these random variables IID? Yes or no? <laughs> Sorry? No, no, in this setting. So now we are back in fact learning. So we were in this, remember the flow chart we had? Yes. So. Why is that? So let's look at this more carefully. Okay. So, what we knew from our setting is that x1, x2 up to xn are iid px. Okay. Z1 is the indicator function that y1 is not equal to h of x1. Z2 is the indicator function that y2 is not equal to h of x2. And Zn, so h is some hypothesis from Rd to minus 1 and plus 1, right? And Zn is 1 of Yn is not equal to h of xn. So this is our definition. And the question is that is it true that if x1 to xn are iid, these events like Z1 to Zn are also going to be IID. Okay, so what was said was if H is fixed beforehand, before I see the training set, I did do not select H after seeing the training set. So I fix H to be say some straight line before I observe the training set. Okay, it's a fixed hypothesis. Then of course H of X1, H of X2 to H of Xn will be IID. Y1 to Yn will be IID because each Yi is just some function of Xi. Then these events are going to be independent. So if H is a fixed hypothesis selected before observing the training set D, then the events, the following events will be IID, H of X1, F Y1, H of X2, Y2, up to H of Xn, 
y n will be i i d yeah, because x 1 to x n are i i d h is some fixed function independent of x 1 to x n then h of x 1 h of x 2 to h of x n will also be i i d because you are computing functions on independent points now y 1 is just f of x 1 and f is some fixed function as well so y 1 to y n are also going to be i i d so when you combine them all these events are i i d and now z i is are just some function applied to these quantities so then z1 to zn are also going to be iid but what is the problem with this setup is there any problem with this like again we choose the h we fix the h before we yeah change, so there is no actual learning there is no actual learning. The problem with this assumption is H has to be fixed before you observe your training set. So there is no learning. You are picking some fixed function, evaluating it on the training data, estimating E in, and then you are going to get an estimate of E out based on E in. But in any learning problem, you train, right? So you want to select H adaptively after observing X1 to Xn. And this is not captured here. But that's okay. We'll We'll see how to fix that, but first we will consider this setting. Okay, so if we make this assumption that H is fixed, then Z1 to Zn are IID. Then what we get is the probability E in of H minus E out of H greater than epsilon is less than 2 e to the minus 2 n epsilon square. I have to use my charger. Is everyone okay? People see what the assumption is. Okay, so this means now what we have shown is that if we were to just evaluate a fixed hypothesis, compute its performance on the training set, then you will already have a good estimate on the test, uh, on the test uh, error as well. So this means that if I set this to be delta, then epsilon will be 1 by 2n log 2 by delta. So if we were to rewrite this expression, then we can say that with probability greater than 1 minus delta, which is the confidence level, E in of H minus E out of H is less than epsilon, and epsilon is 1 by 2n log 2 by delta. So this is our confidence level. If we were to set this confidence level, the gap between E and E out, E in and E out is at most 1 over root 10 log 2 by delta. And typically, we can ignore the absolute value. We only want to get a bound, we only want to say that E out is not large enough. So this means we have two parts. We have E out minus E in is less than 1 by 2n log 2 by delta and we have the other way around, right? The absolute value implies both these cases hold. Because the absolute value is small, 
we can write it in two ways e out minus e in is less than this and e in minus e out now typically we always want to say that the out of sample error is not large enough so we are almost always interested in the first inequality rather than the second inequality so we'll just use the first one and we have that e out of h is less than e in of h plus 1 by 2n log 2 by delta. So what this is saying is that if I computed, if I evaluated my hypothesis on the training set and I got some error, say I was wrong on 1% of the samples, so e in was 0 0.01. Then an n was a billion, right? Then I can, and then I, and then if, 19, if I want 99% confidence in level, I will set delta to be 0 0.01. And I can just evaluate this right hand side. This will be log 2 over 0 0.01 times 1 over 2n. n is million, this will be 1 over 2 million. Take the square root, and that will give you how far it is, e in will what the largest value of E out will be. It will give you a bound on E out. So this is the style of bounds we will be saying. We will be fixing a confidence level and then we will be computing an upper bound on E out using formulas like this. Okay. Now, there is of course an issue, as was pointed out, in practice, H will not be fixed. It is selected after observing our training set D, so after observing all the endpoints. And so let G in H be the output selected after observing our training set D. Okay. And we want to find a bound like the one we saw before, but of a relationship between E out of G and E in of G. So E out of G, E in of G is 1 over N summation of the error over the training set, summation of I going from 1 to N, 1 of Y I is not equal to G of X I and this is Z I, right? And E out of G is the probability that y is not equal to gx and this is mu. So again it's the same setup, mu is unknown to us, this is what we want to estimate and we want to estimate it using E in, right? E in is the average training error, so it's the number of errors we make on our training set, x1, y1, x2, y2, 2, x and yn and we call this zi. But it was pointed out before that if G is selected after looking at the training set, then these ZIs are no longer IID. Can anyone explain why in one sentence, why ZIs are no longer IID? When H was fixed, we actually argued here, we went and we argued here that the ZIs will be IIDs, right? What happens if I replace this H with the G which is selected after looking at the training set? Why does the IID assumption break down? Yeah? G is a function of x1 to xn, right? 
So this, if I replace this h by g, then that g uh, function g is selected as a function of x1, x2 up to xn. It might be say the average of x1 to xn as if it's linear classification. Then this quantity here depends on all uh, x1 to xn. This quantity depends on all x1 to xn and so on. So now these terms are no longer independent. Previously, if h was selected before looking at the data, then this was some fixed function. And this is only dependent on x1. You replace this h by g, this becomes dependent on the entire training set. This becomes dependent on the entire training set and so on. Is this clear? So that's a big jump now because we cannot directly apply Hofding's inequality. Now the problem is that Z1 to Zn is no longer iid so hofding does not apply so this bound that we just derived on the previous slide which seem pretty useful in practice will not apply if I replace h by g because this was derived using Hofding. So you cannot guarantee that if your in-sample error is small, the test error will also be small by, it will be upper bounded by this quantity. That guarantee no longer applies if h is replaced by g. But we want to derive a similar guarantee by doing some modifications. So the way we will approach it is we'll first introduce something called the union bound. I hope everyone has seen this in a probability course. It says that if A1, A2 up to AM are arbitrary events, then if I look at the probability of two events, A1 union A2, this is the probability of A1 plus probability of A2 minus probability of A1 intersection A2, right? This is the exclusion inclusion principle. And in particular, this is less than probability of A1 plus the probability of A2. With equality, if A1 and A2 are disjoint. Everyone has seen this union bound. So this is really the chapter where you need all your background in probability. That's why that course 302 or its equivalent is a prerequisite. This can be generalized to M events. If I take the union of M events, then this is less than the summation of I going from 1 to M probability of AI. Everyone has seen this as well. And again you have equality if A1, A2 up to AM are disjoint events. Okay. So this was a review. Now our goal, our task is to get a bound on this event. We want to upper bound this quantity, right? The probability that for the output hypothesis G, the test error and the training error deviate by more than epsilon. So the claim is the following, we are, and we will do that using union bound. The reason we discussed union bound is we want to use union bound to get a handle on this quantity.
So the claim is the following. For any training set D, if we compute G and if the following event holds, then one of the following <coughs> events must hold. Which events? Either E in of H1 minus E out of H1 is greater than epsilon or E in of H2 minus E out of H2 is greater than epsilon or E in of H3 minus E out of H3 is greater than epsilon all the way up to E in of HM minus E out of HM is greater than epsilon. So we are given some training set, we compute G and it turns out that this G is a bad G in the sense that E in of G minus E out of G is greater than epsilon. We are outside our confidence interval. Okay? Then the claim is that if that event happens, then necessarily one of these events must happen. Either the first hypothesis is bad or the second hypothesis in our set is bad or the last hypothesis. One of these M hypothesis must be bad. It cannot be the case that all of them are good, that they are within the confidence level if G is uh, outside the confidence level. Why is that the case? This is obvious or is this require some proof? What we are saying is, if this event happens, then one of these events must necessarily happen. It cannot be that all of them are good, all the hypotheses in our set H are good, but the output hypothesis G is bad. Exactly. G is just one of these M hypotheses, right? So if G, sat, if G is bad, then clearly one of them has to be bad. Because imagine H1 is good, so H1 does not satisfy this, H2 does not satisfy this, H3 does not satisfy this, and so on. If all of them uh, are going to be less than epsilon, then there is no way G will be greater than epsilon, because G is either H1 or H2 or H3 up to Hn. This is a completely obvious statement. So the proof is basically that since G belongs to H, G is equal to H1 or G is equal to H2 or G equals Hm. So this event is equivalent to whichever G um, whichever hypothesis G corresponds to, that one has to deviate by definition. Okay? So the event, so this event is now a subset of these events. So the event that E n of G minus E out of G is greater than epsilon, this event is a subset of the union of I going from 1 to N, the events E in of H i minus E out of H i is greater than epsilon. Because if this event happens, then there must be at least one of these events that also happen. So this event is a subset of this. That's just rewriting what I had here. I wrote it in words, but this is 
mathematical equivalent to saying that this event here is a subset of this event here. And so the probability, now we use the union bound, that E in of G minus E out of G is greater than epsilon is less than, or this is actually equal to the probability of I going from 1 to N, E in of HI minus E out of HI greater than epsilon. Okay. And this is less than the summation of i going from 1 to m, probability of e in of hi minus e out of hi greater than epsilon. This is from the union bound. Now what can you say about these quantities here? Can we bound these quantities? Can we bound probability E in of H1 minus E out of H1 greater than epsilon? Do we know how to bound that? What is the bound? The bound. Hofdings. Hofdings applies to each of these terms because H1, H2 up to Hm were selected before looking at the data set. The hypothesis class was selected before looking at the data set. So H1 was fixed beforehand, H2 was fixed beforehand, H3 was fixed beforehand and so on. Only G is the one that was selected adaptively, right? But G can be either H1, H2 up to HN. So for each one of them, we can apply Hofdings. But will the sum of those Hofdings be still be a tight bound? It may not be. It's a bound. We'll discuss in general it won't be. If m is large, it won't be a very tight bound. But it is a bound. It's better than nothing. Right? So right now, we'll just give one bound. It's, the point is this may or may not be tight. In fact, it's often not tight. If, especially if m is large, we'll discuss why. And then we'll fix it. We'll actually fix this bound when m is very large. When m goes to infinite, this bound is not useful. And we'll see how to fix it. But as a first step, we use the union bound. So this is 2m e to the minus 2n epsilon square. So what have we achieved? We have achieved an upper bound on the probability that e in minus e out is greater than epsilon when g is adaptively selected. No longer g is fixed. We allow, we make full observation of the data and does not matter which algorithm we use. We could use SGD, we could use some brute force search. It does not matter how G is selected. All that matters is G is either H1, H2, H3 or HM. Regardless of the learning algorithm, we have now upper bounded the probability that E in minus E out is greater than epsilon. And that is 2M e to the minus 2N epsilon square. This one, from how to, where it went from this, because of the, uh, this is uh, included in this set. So we, we assume the equality because we are assuming all the HIs are in the uh, It's a subset, mm -hmm. right? Oh, it's a subset. Oh, I mean, I take it back. You can have an inequality. I think this is not right. I think it's an inequality. It still works in the right direction. It may not be equal because you could have this event, but that does not imply this event if that H is not selected. That's my bad. Okay, so summary, if G is selected 
after observing d then our bound becomes the following then probability e in of g minus e out of g greater than epsilon is less than 2m e to the minus 2n epsilon square. So the Hofding bound <coughs> weakens by a factor of m. We now have this additional m which is a number of hypotheses in the upper bound. If we set this to equal delta, then epsilon will equal 1 by 2n log 2m by delta. So now we instead of 2 by delta, we get 2m. Right? And if we do the same calculation that we did before, then we have the following result. With probability greater than 1 minus delta, E out of G is less than E in of G plus 1 over square root of 2n log 2m by delta. So what this is saying is that if you have some in-sample training error, right, then your test error is not going to be too big. It's bounded by this plus a quantity which scales as 1 over square root of the number of samples in your training set and increases as log of 2m, where m is the number of hypotheses in your set. So this is just a tweak we did on the previous analysis where h was fixed and now we have a bound between the test error and the training error in terms of two quantities m which is the number of hypotheses you have so that's a measure of complexity the more hypothesis you have the more rich your hypothesis class is and n which is the number of training samples. There is also another way of looking at it. We let in the literature people often consider something called the generalization error. Delta of G which is the gap between E out of G and E in of G. This is known as the generalization error. Okay? And you take the absolute value, so it remains positive. What we have is that the probability delta G is greater than epsilon is less than 2m e to the minus 2n epsilon square. Or in other words, if we set this to delta, then with probability greater than 1 minus delta, we can have that the generalization error is bounded by 1 over 2n log 2m by delta. The same thing, just written in terms of the generalization error. So generalization error tells us what's the gap between the error you measure on the training set and the actual error that we are interested in. So we want the generalization error to be small. And this is saying that the generalization error scales as two terms. One is the number of samples and the second is the number of hypotheses. It scales as 1 over square root of the number of samples and log of the number of hypotheses. So n here is the number of training samples 
and m is the number of hypotheses in H, right? So we want to compare two quantities, delta of G and E n of G. We can increase m and we can increase n. If m increases, then you are adding more and more hypothesis in your set. According to this relationship here, delta of g will keep increasing. So delta of g increases as m increases, right? which means that your generalization ability starts decreasing. The gap between the test error and training error could increase because of chance of overfitting. What about training error? If you increase them, will the training error go up or will it go down? So if you are making H, now remember H has M hypothesis. And you're increasing M, so you're giving more and more hypothesis in H. Do you expect your training error to go up or go down? It will go down. Now let's say we increase N. Then according to this formula, the generalization error will decrease, right? Because you're adding more samples, so you have a richer training set to train over, there's a higher chance to generalize. And this formula also says that the generalization error decreases. What about the training error? If you increase the size of D, do you expect the training error to go up or do you expect it to go down? So you fix M, maybe M is 2 say, you have only two hypotheses and you pick one that is better. But now you increase M. First you do the experiment with 10 samples, then you do it with 100 samples, then you do it with 1000 samples. Will the training error start increasing or will it start keep decreasing as you increase n? How many think it will increase? That is the right answer. The training error will increase as you increase n because now you have to satisfy more and more examples. So for the same complexity, you are satisfying more constraints. So the chances are you will make errors and this means that the training error will increase as n increases. Yeah? As you increase the number of hypotheses, why would the training error decrease? Because you have more options to select. Yeah, so isn't the search base larger? So, so you can decrease, right? Because you have the, so now the number of, so you will try H1, then you will increase H2, then select H2, then select H3. So you have more hypothesis now to search for decreasing the training error. Oh, it's assuming that G is like the best. Uh, yeah, let's say typically that's what you do, right? Just G will be the best. Okay. So let's look at this more in more detail. <coughs> so let's catch the error as a function of m. So we fix n here, we fix the number of training samples and we want to sketch the error as a function of m. Now we'll compute the E in. The training error will always decrease as we increase m because we have more hypothesis now to select. Right? So the training error will look like this. As you increase m, the training error will decrease. Delta of G, the generalization error, it will look like this. Because delta of G increases as square root of log M. As you, for a fixed N, it increases as square root of log M. Now E out of G, can be bounded as E n of G plus delta of G. The test error will be the sum of the training error plus the generalization error. So it will be the sum of these two curves. 
right? So the test error will look like this. So it will initially decrease and then at some point it will plateau out and then it will get a hit because the generalization error is going to start increasing. So which of these regions is overfitting and which region is underfitting? Where would you put overfitting here for the model? It's in the right, right? This region here is overfitting. Here there is a big gap between E out and E in. E in is very small because there are too many hypotheses and the model is complex. But because of that the generalization error is big and hence E out is also going to be big. So there is a gap between E out and E in. E in is not a good reflection of E out. Similarly this area here is underfitting. Here the gap between E out and E in is small but E in itself is small, is large because we don't have enough number of hypotheses to do well. So you want to operate somewhere in the middle here, you want to select M star here where E out is minimum. Now let's do the same plot but we fix M and we change N, we change the number of samples. So let's first sketch E in of G as a function of N. So we just argued on the previous uh, slide that as you increase N, E in will actually increase. It's not going to decrease because for the same number of hypotheses now, you have to fit into more training points. So you will cause errors. You have more constraints now that you have to satisfy. So E in of G might look something like this. It will start small when N is small and then as you start increasing N it will start increasing. Delta of G on the other hand scales as 1 over square root of 2N. Right? So delta of G may look like this. And E out again is the sum of the two. So E out might look like this. So where is overfitting here? Is it to the left or to the right? It is to the left. You always have to look at the gap between the test error and the training error. This is the training error. This is the test error. When the gap is big, you have overfitting. So what is happening here is you have too few samples. M is fixed. So for that number of samples, you have chosen too complex a model. If you are on the right side, then E out and E in will be close to each other, right? But E in is large because for the number of samples that you have, now you have too simple a model. It cannot capture all the features. So your in sample error, the training error is large. So this is the underfitting case. And so here your model is too complex. It's not too, it's too it should be increased. Now M should be increased if you want to reduce E in. But for this value of M, this is not the right model to use. And so now the ideal number of samples would be somewhere here, where the test error is the smallest. So this is insightful. But now we go back to the main problem with this analysis. What is the main problem? What is the limitation of all this analysis? Can we apply it to the perceptron algorithm, for example? What's the problem? 
So there were two, there was one big, big problem that was identified before that we were not selecting G adaptively. Here G is now selected adaptively, right? So that problem is solved. Finite M, finite M is a problem. This is assuming that you had those three hypotheses that were fixed beforehand. Like you go back to very early on. So all the way here, right? We are fixing three hypotheses like this. So M would require you to fix these lines beforehand and select one out of them. But if you look at, say, linear classification, like binary linear classification, your weights can be anything. You can select any line adaptively, right? And perceptron algorithm finds it. Similarly, in neural networks, you can choose any weights. So you have infinite many possibilities. It's very artificial to fix a certain number of hypotheses like this and then pick one out of them. That's almost never done. We have a continuous space for our model parameters and almost always that means that M will be infinite. So although this analysis is insightful, although this analysis is insightful for finite M, there is a big limitation. That M is finite. And in fact, even when M is finite, the bounds are very loose. If you say, well, let me discretize the space and let M to be let, like a million and then use these bounds, they won't be very useful. The bound, this is an upper bound, this gap bound will be very loose. So even if you optimize the upper bound, it will not be a good reflection for the test error, right? So, So because of this, this analysis directly is not useful. We have to make one, take one more step and refine this analysis further when M is, in, when M is infinite. So we have to find, do a more refined analysis to account for the case when M is infinite. So let's see now, we'll do this next lecture, uh, but we will now take a step and understand why the bound is so loose, why this bound does not generalize to the case when M is very large. So recall in our analysis, we had to bound this quantity. Okay. And the key step, the main step we did was to use union bound. We said this was upper bounded by this event. Or let me just write the final step. Uh, Okay. And then this was upper bounded by the summation This was the sequence of steps we did to derive an upper bound on this quantity and then we applied Hofding at, e at each of these steps to get the factor of M, right? Now, when, is, uh, when do we have an equality here? So the question is, how tight is this union bound going to be in our, our setting? So we have this union here of events and we upper bound it by this step here. And the question is how tight is this bound going to be? 
So first of all, when is the union bound tight? When all the events that we consider, all these events are disjoint. So when all events So these are the events are disjoint, right? We want, if all these events in the union bound, they are disjoint, then the union bound is tight, which means that if a data set is bad for H1, it should not be bad for H2. If a training set causes this event for H1, it should not cause the say a bad event for H2. Or if it causes a bad event for H2, it should not cause a bad event for all other hypotheses. If the same training set causes a bad event for H1 and H2 and H3 and so on, then you have overlap. And then the, this bound will not be tight. So the question is, do we expect this step to be tight or not? Right? Do we expect the events to be disjoint or not? Okay. What do you guys think? Is it going to be that the events are exclusive so that if a data set causes a bad event on each one, so you violate this, it will not cause a bad event on each two or do you think they will be overlapping? So let's do an example to see this. So let's consider the case when we are in two dimensions and let's say this is x1 and this is x2 okay and let's say the ground truth is this line so the line x1 equals 0 is the true hypothesis which means that if you are on this side y equals plus 1 and you are on this side, y is minus 1. Okay? This is the unknown function, f of x, that we don't know. But this is how the labels are generated. If x1 is positive, then the label is plus 1. If x1 is negative, the label is minus 1. Right? Now you get two training points. So let's say you get a point here and you get a point here. Our n is 2. So you don't observe the ground truth. All you observe are two points. You get a point here and the label is plus. You get a point here and the label is minus. Right? And we try to fit. Let's say H1 is this line. This is H1. So for H1, if you are on this side, your label is plus. And if you are on this side, your label is minus. Okay, this is H1. <coughs> so H1 will have E in of 0. So for H1, E in is 0 because you are correct here and you are correct here. Right? There are two labels, you are correct on both of them, and so E in is 0. But how will you compute E out for H1 in this diagram? Where is the errors going to happen for H1 in this diagram? When, when will you, if you, which test point will cause an error? Yeah? Basically, if you are here, then H, the label H1 will assign will be minus 1 the ground truth will be plus 1. So if you are in this region, you will have an error, 
right? If the data point comes similarly, if you are in this region, you will have an error. So if we call that region A1, then you have an error if you are in this region A1. And so E out is the probability that X belongs to this region A1, which is not small. Now we don't know the distribution, but imagine that it's something uniform in this square, then the probability of lying in A1 is going to be large. And so E in, E in is zero, but E out will exceed the threshold epsilon. So this is a hypothesis that looks good on this set but it is going to lead to the violation. So this data point is a bad data point because for with respect to H1 because it causes this violation. E in is small, but E out is large. Now let's consider another data point, another hypothesis. Let's consider H2. H2 is this line. So if you are here, then you are minus and if you are here, you are plus. Okay, this is another hypothesis. Will this data point be bad for H2 as well? The question is, if those events were disjoint, then this data point cannot be bad for H2. That is what we require for the tightness of the bound. But the question is, is this data point, if this set also bad for H2? Well, so again, let's consider E in, E in of H2, if you look at H2, does it make error at this point? Well, on this side, the label is plus, on this side, the label is minus. So E in of H2 is zero, and E out of H2, how do we compute that? We have to look at the bad events for H2. So this is H2, it's setting plus here. So what's the bad event for H2? Anything, maybe that falls here. Here you have a conflict and here you have a conflict, right? So E out of H2, if we call this A2, is probability that X belongs to A2. And this is also going to be large. So this, the point is this data set is also bad for H2. So the same data point is bad for both H1 and H2. Now you can think of many other hypotheses. Why H1? You can slightly perturb it and draw another line. That's also, this data set is also going to be bad for that one as well. You can take another perturbation of H2, draw another line. So if you had a large number of linear hypotheses, that the same data set will be simultaneously bad for many of them. So it's you're going to have a heavy amount of overlap. It's not a little bit of overlap. So those intersection events are going to be rather significant. And so because of that, when you do the union bound, you're heavily overcounting the overlap of bad events for all the hypotheses. And so this is not the right way of doing the upper bound. So this step here, is extremely loose in practice. You should avoid this thing. So, there is heavy overlap between the bad data sets for H1 to HM. And because of this, the union bound is very, very weak. And as a result of this, this analysis does not generalize when M is large. There are still applications where this is sufficient, in particular when we study model selection using validation, we will actually use these bounds. So this is not completely just an exercise. This will be useful later on in the course, the case of finite M. But it's not useful, say, for perceptron algorithm or the basic questions we are interested in. Yeah? Uh, but it, isn't that uh, overlapping interrelationship between features something our model is trying to extract and be critical? Well, the overlap, what we are saying here is, if you look at this particular bound, 
where we take the union, the events are the data sets that we are getting, right? The event here which is implicit is that there is a data set D. For that data set, do I have this violation or not? Now the only way the data sets, this bound can be tight is that if a data set causes a violation on H1, it should not cause a violation on any other events. Because if, if they does, then the same, there is an intersection between these events. And then you are double counting the probabilities, right? So that is all we are saying, right? In practice, uh, there is, of course, uh, what we will be doing is the algorithm would typically start with an estimate and start tweaking it. So we will be moving it. We are exploiting the continuity and the fact that there are infinite number of hypotheses. So learning algorithm could exploit that to find the best. But here we are not talking about that fact. We are just saying that having overlap of bad events across hypotheses is what makes this bound weak. And the way we will fix this is by introducing a notion. So in chapter 2 that we will do next week, we will study the concept called effective number of hypotheses. So the point is that we should not count all the M hypothesis and apply the union bound on all M hypothesis. We will find a way of applying this union bound on a subset of hypotheses that are carefully chosen so that the events are disjoint. Okay? So for, the, for this subset of hypotheses, the union bound will still be valid. So it will be done in a way that the union bound is still valid and the associated events are disjoint. But it is not obvious how to do that, right? This will require a concept of VC dimension and growth function. So this is probably the, going to be the most abstract lecture in the course, in the next week's lecture. This week's lecture was just building up towards next week, right? So we are going to finish it's five minutes early, but I think that's okay. Uh, this was a heavy lecture. Next week is going to be much more abstract and a lot heavier than this week. So.